Thank you very much, Gustavo Schwartz and Don Estayo International Physics Center for inviting me to come here to San Sebastian. Uh, very excited to be in San Sebastian, which is an extraordinary place, and you have your own art science um, collisions happening at DIPC, thanks to Gustavo, who's making collisions between literature and science. Uh, but what I'm going to talk to you about is some collisions <laughs> which happen at CERN in Geneva um, and how they happen. I sometimes say, I kind of tease the Director General of CERN and I say to him, um, look, you know, we got this great experiment which is the Large Hadron Collider which has discovered the existence of the Higgs boson, a particle which gives matter mass, but actually we've got many, many theories about human imagination and creativity and ingenuity, but we've never discovered those, and those are the most elusive things of all. And what we're doing at CERN is making collisions between imaginations of the artists and science. So it's another great experiment, which I sometimes say to the Director General we're having. Um, and he laughs and says, yes. So CERN is an extraordinary place. And uh, one thing which has kind of come out of it, I'm going to start with this thing, is a choreography, which is now on a world international tour. It's covered 80,000 kilometers. Um, it opened in New York last week. Um, and it opens in Vancouver in two days. It's called Quantum and it was by our first artist in residence who came in 2012, Gilles Jobin. And I'm just going to play you a little clip so you get a kind of feel for this choreography, which came out of the ideas of science. It's not describing it or illustrating it. It's just a choreography which came out of it. So you'll have to forgive me. I'm really bad at... Um, PowerPoint. I'm really bad at this... Um, uh, computing with um, PC. I'm going to use a Mac. It's gone off as well. <laughs> yeah, technologically not very good, so you're going to have to bear with me during this whole exercise. Um, Quantum basically was a choreography which came out of Gilles Jobin's residency with us, which was for three months, and I will talk about that soon. But first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about CERN and what we do there. CERN is a fundamental research laboratory for science, but I've now also created it as a fundamental research laboratory for the arts and for artists of many different kinds, whether it's dancers, whether it's sculptors, whether it's data artists, hopefully soon writers, many different art forms, filmmakers, for example. And CERN is unusual in the science world because we don't create science which um, is applied knowledge. We just seek knowledge for its own sake. 
So exactly the same principles are given to the artists. They just seek creating things for its own sake and discovery there. So this is CERN. <laughs> this is a kind of representation. It's a 27-kilometer ring under the Earth, and it is the world's largest man-made machine which recreates the moment just after the universe was born. It's located across two frontiers, across the frontier of Switzerland and France, so it's very wonderful that it's also engaging with another frontier, which is the one between arts and science. So it's very appropriate in many ways that it does that. On the ring, the 27-kilometer ring, there are four giant detectors. If you imagine that the ATLAS detector and the CMS detector, which are diagonally opposite each other, they're like giant cameras. And when we collide particles, which you and I are made up of, they're the fundamental thing which we're made up of, we collide them in the 27-kilometer machine. And these um, detectors take photographs of them in essence. It's a kind of way of describing what they do. Take snapshots of the particles as they collide together and smash together and have spray coming off it. Um, they are quite extraordinary uh, things. And actually, if you look at them, oh, they're the only thing of their kind made in the universe. Each one is totally unique. Uh, it's a prototype which is actually working. So it, in a way, it's an art form in its own right because there's no other thing like it. Each one is totally different. CERN came out of the Second World War uh, when, after the devastation of the Second World War, um, scientists fled to the USA and Europe was very concerned about it and said, we need to bring them back. Um, and we need to show that science is for peace and for peaceful means. So CERN was created in 1954, 54, yeah, and it's our 60th anniversary this year. The mission of CERN is to push back the frontiers of knowledge, to understand that moment just after the universe was born, to develop new technologies for doing this, train scientists and engineers of tomorrow, and unite people from all over the world. So my argument always was, <gasps> You can't leave out arts from this because artists have a frontiers of knowledge. They engage with the senses, which is a form of knowledge, as well as intuition. Artists engage with a lot of the new technologies, and they can also, they need training as well, and they come from different countries as well. So there's a perfect match. That was one of my arguments <laughs> to the Director General of CERN. Uh, the other argument was to be a true cultural force in the 21st century, you can't just be uh, science and technology, you have to also engage with the arts. In that way, you really are engaging with everything in the world which makes us human. Because science, technology and the arts are expressions of what it is to be human in the world and why and how we are in the world. They just do it in different ways and have different procedures. But they're both totally driven by discovery and wanting to go further and find out more. Probably heard of CERN because in uh, July the 4th, 2012, we discovered the so-called famous Higgs boson, which had been a theory postulated about 40 years before by three scientists, but in fact, um, there were three other scientists who had also been in, had thought of that theory as well. But it's always known as the Higgs, but actually it wasn't just one man. It was many other people contributed to that knowledge. As I said, CERN was founded in 54 by 12 European states, and today there are 21 European member states which fund it. Spain was actually one of the original funder, founders of CERN and has always been involved. Um, CERN itself employs only 2,000 people, but there are 11,000 people from around the world who are paid by their institutions who come to CERN. So they're 
they come from 100 countries around the world, um, actually. And so, for example, some bits of the machinery have been supplied by Japan, have been supplied by the USA in exchange for knowledge. So there's subsidization in that way, as well as the member states paying for CERN. And that map just shows you where CERN exists. So anything which is white is where CERN doesn't exist. So it gives you an idea that there, there's representations all around the world. And um, yeah. So as I said, we push back the frontiers of knowledge. And the great thing about science is it doesn't give you the truth. In fact, we know so little. Uh, we only know about 5 6% of the universe really and we don't know about the other 95% um, so think about it we don't know anything at all really and so it's great to try and find out more and one of the things we're trying to find out at CERN is why this material world which we exist in actually came into being how it came into being how did how come you're sitting on a chair and it's solid because when the universe was born and matter and antimatter collided, luckily there was less antimatter. We should be in an antimaterial world, but instead we're in a material world in which we exist. So how did that happen and why? This just gives you an idea really of what we're doing. We go back in time. We sometimes say we're a super microscope because we go way back in time with our machine which is the one you can see, that, um, that kind of pipe, that's the magnet through which um, the dipoles, through which the particles are accelerated. And we go below the atom, below the molecule, we go right below the nucleus, and we go down to the fundamental particles which make us up, and those are called quarks. So very quickly, some things have come out of the engagement with um, looking at the universe. And that's just accident, really. So PET scans, MRI scans, for example, have come out of uh, us investigating the universe um, and imaging, medical imaging. But things like actually touch screens, mice and computers, they've all come out of CERN technology. The World Wide Web was born at CERN. That came out of it, and that's really revolutionized our life. But that, those all came out as a byproduct, not as the reason why CERN existed, which kind of shows the beauty of fundamental research, knowledge for its own sake. Um, uh, this is just a very quick thing. So we sometimes say we're the fastest racetrack on the planet because we accelerate our protons, these particles, just under the speed of light in opposite directions, and they collide um, 11,000 times a second. But they do that in big bunches. So actually, there are 100,000 collisions per second. It makes your head fall off. I always get really kind of when I think about that. Um, and out of that, we take all the data, but only of 100 collisions per second. We throw the rest away. It's a very empty place as well because we create the vacuums inside the dipoles in order to allow the particles to go under the speed of light. And also to keep it cool, we have a cryogenic system where everything is minus 271 degrees Celsius. So the Large Hadron Collider, this 27 kilometer machine, is actually what even is one of the coldest places there is in the universe, I mean, it's even colder than outer space. But it's also the hottest place in the galaxy as well, where the protons collide, because they generate energy, which is the equivalent of a thousand million times the, the thing of the sun, the warmth of the sun, but in a very tiny microscopic space. So if you think about it, the human ingenuity and engineering and science and technology which has created this is absolutely incredible. And as I said, they are, they've got these big detectors, which are like giant cameras, which record the collisions as they happen uh, in the big machine. And in order to crunch all the data, we have an extensive computer system. We have a distributive grid system where computers around the world are actually crunching the data as it happens. Um, this gives you an idea of the kind of running jobs in just 
seconds, exactly what was happening at that, at that moment that's in Gibby Bites, which is kind of makes your head fall off if you knew how big that was. Uh, it's an extraordinary speed, and the crunching is happen happening almost in real time. So why, why on earth, when you've got this incredible machine, have we got the arts happening at CERN? What on earth is that doing there? Um, well, if you look at Picasso and the Cubist movement in the whole of the 20th century and the modernist movement in Europe, it was really highly influenced by Eisenberg and his theories of uncertainty, but also, for example, by Einstein and the theories of relativity, which really challenged our notion of the subject in the world and the object in the world. And it's really challenged it to the point of saying there's no one way of looking at the world. There are many different ways. So you have, for example, also uh, composers like Zanarkis really drawing on that, or writers as well, who really draw on the notion that truth is always moving and changing. Um, and those ideas from science have percolated through. But it's a two-way exchange. So if you look at literature, for example, this is a quote from Finnegan's Wake by the Irish um, author uh, James Joyce. Three corks for Mr. Mark. Um, the term cork was taken by the physicist Murray Gelman. Uh, he's very literary, he's very musical, and he went, right, I'm going to have that term for the fundamental particle which makes us the whole universe. So he borrowed from literature, and that's become the fundamental particle. Now, when I went to CERN in 2008, I discovered lots and lots of uh, artists had gone through the doors, and CERN didn't realize. <laughs> they didn't know who these people were. Um, they didn't realize that they'd had a famous photographer called Andreas Gursky going through their door, for example or that Bjork had come, and all these artists had gone away and been inspired by CERN. Um, and I said to CERN, look, there must be a way of showing the legacy of how particle physics in the 21st century is really influencing the arts. So you need an arts program. And if you look at this opera set, that's very direct rip-off, in a way, a copy of the Atlas detector, for example. But CERN had had something before, but it had been created by an institute in London called Signatures of the Invisible. And artists, eight artists being picked by the filmmaker Ken McMullen to come to CERN and engage with the science. They'd been brought to CERN. Um, so something had gone before. And that was a very important thing for me when I did a four-month feasibility study at CERN, saying trying to prove why I thought it should happen. I talked to the artists and the scientists who were involved in that program to build on that legacy. And what I discovered was uh, one artist, a very world famous artist, had created a piece of work which I can only describe as terrible. <laughs> and I said to him, why did you create such a terrible piece of work of art? I was really direct with him. And he's a very direct man and he said, I did it because I was so cross and I only went for one day. I had no explanation when I went there. I had nobody explaining the physics. I was just left there. It wasn't CERN's fault, but it was very much the fact that the artist was expressing that he needed somebody to explain the physics and the science and he felt awash in this sea of 11,500 um, scientists. But equally, the scientists were cross because they felt artists came in and stole their ideas. And these are scientists who work together in collaborations. They're very communal. Uh, we have our own bank. We have our own travel agent at CERN. We have our own post office at CERN. And the scientists work in groups of 3,500 people together. So an artist coming in and then disappearing, they're like, who was that? What happened? And they want the artist to be part of the community. So when I created Collide at CERN, it was really important that the artists became embedded at CERN, just as I had become embedded when I was doing the feasibility study. I very much believe that artists and physicists in particular <laughs> are twins, basically. They're amazing twins, because physicists divide between the theorists who think beyond the paradigm 
and the experimentalist who then tests that um, theory and prove whether it happens or not, whether it exists or not. And that's what an artist does. An artist is both a theorist and experimentalist. So I think there's a very strong match also between arts and particle physics. And equally, as I said, both are looking at why we exist in the world and how we do. So when I created the program, I was determined <laughs> to bring in arts, not arts which illustrated or described the science, no. <laughs> and I made my life very, very difficult by doing that because if I had, I would have got a communications budget from CERN. No, what I wanted to do was to create a cultural change and bring arts and science on exactly the same level together where the ideas of science become springboards of the imagination for artists. Now, that has always happened for millennia, but I really wanted it to be expressed in an official program in a science institution to really create change. And one way of doing it is also to kind of explain what you're doing in the language of science. So what I would call curation or selection for the scientists I called peer review because they understood it. Um, and what I also very much was keen to do was to show that I wasn't going to um, influence the process because every, the scientists I talked to said, oh, anybody can be an artist, but not everybody can be a scientist. Anybody can be an artist, it's just who you know. And I went, no, 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 there's a whole history of art, there's a whole excellence in the artistic process which has to be judged. We have peer review in the arts, just like you do in science. So it was very important that we created an international competition with a jury, with scientists also on the jury, as well as artists on the jury, to select the artists. So it wasn't seen to be personal prejudice, and that was really keen. So I created a policy for CERN called Great Arts for Great Science. It does what it says, really, is to bring in artists who show excellence, whether they're young or old or middle, <laughs> at the same level as the scientists, and to create an equal platform. And again, it was important. I kind of also thought it was good that I didn't put the load of the artists finding the money. I found the money for the artists to come to CERN, so they came already funded. So there was no kind of second-class citizen uh, fact about it. Also created a cultural board at CERN, made up of people from the arts, leading people from the arts to bring in knowledge, like Beatrix Roof, who's been, who was uh, the director of the Kunsthal in Zurich and has now moved to a big Dutch museum, as well as Michael Dozer in the middle, who's um, a world expert on antimatter. And we have creative artistic patrons who are all artists who've come to CERN and been inspired. So they're not people who just say, oh, it's a great idea. They're people who've been impacted by it, like Jacques Herzog, for example, the architect, or Mariko Mori, the Japanese-American artist. So Collide at CERN was an artist residency program which is, uh, launch, was launched in 2011 and it's got two strands, one which is funded by the city and canton of Geneva um, and the other one which is funded by private sponsors uh, with some little bit of prize money from Ars Electronica Linz and it's an open international competition judged by a jury with prize money and li living costs and travel and it's very much about having the artist paired with a scientist. They have to live on site. Sometimes the artist goes, oh my gosh, is this where I've got to be? Um, they're put in an office just like a scientist, so they live just like a scientist. And they engage with the scientists in many different ways. And you can follow their progress on blogs, which we do. Um, our first partner, as I said, was Ars Electronica Linz, and with them we did a big international um, uh, symposium in 2011 to announce the um, to announce the Collide at CERN program. And it was a big conference which looked at CERN and said, "Is this a model for the future? Is this how society should be?" And it was kind of critical and engaging. And it's the first time CERN had ever ever opened up its borders and engaged with an arts symposium and a big conference. 
Um, the first winner of our competition was an extraordinary artist called Julius von Bismarck. We had 400 entries from 44 countries. Uh, Julius is like an artist terrorist. He's great fun. Basically, he believes in kind of confronting our notions of perception uh, and reality, our perception of reality, which is exactly what particle physics does. Um, and you see him here with a camera. He went to press conferences and pointed his camera at photographers. And when they went back to expose their negatives, they found mysterious things on top, like the Dove of Peace on top of Chairman Mao. So in that way, he was saying, we're controlled by the media, but I can control the media too. So he was making a very strong social statement of disturbance and interference. You saw the choreography by our first choreographer in residence, uh, Gilles Jobin. Um, Gilles was interesting because he left school at 16 and he came to CERN and was terrified initially because physicists, when they sit around talking about beam dump and wimpzillas and talking in this kind of strange language, that he didn't understand it. And I said to him, actually, it doesn't matter if you don't understand. Uh, actually, you have an amazing knowledge, and your knowledge is embodied knowledge. It's the knowledge of your body, and it's inside you, and you should be responding with your gut and your instinct when you hear scientists talk. So when a scientist said to him, oh, um, gravity is the weakest force, it really revolutionized his way of looking at dance. Because as a dancer, he'd been trained to always think of the ground being stable and gravity being a really strong pull. When he discovered it was the weakest force and that the body is in perpetual motion inside us and that inside us we have collisions which mimic the beginning of the universe, whew, his whole world exploded. Oh, totally, his whole choreographic training exploded and quantum came out of that, for example. Now, every single artist is um, matched with a scientist. I do a bit of speed dating, that's what I call it. I basically choose a scientist who I think will take the artist further and choose an artist who I think will take the scientist further. So it's a mutual matchmaking. And this partnership is between Julius von Bismarck and a specialist on hidden worlds called James Wells. Um, and they're always paired with the expectation that they create nothing. All they do is talk together. Now, that is very important that you have that expectation. And I do that as a political statement because I believe in this society we've become too product-driven, uh, we've become too time-driven, and we've lost trust in artists. But an artist exists to create and meet, make, a work of art takes as long as it will take, and I know that any artist who comes to CERN will make something. It will just take as long as it takes. And these two, whilst they did create something actually during the residency, are still creating things, and um, we're creating a public artwork which will be shown in Athens and will be a comment on civilization um, in 2016. This is our uh, one of our artists in residence. He was meant to be with us for three months, um, and he looks like a miner, doesn't he? Uh, he's equipped with a helmet. He's got a dosometer as well as a camera, a dosometer to check the radiation. And the reason why is he lived in here. <laughs> he lived inside there for 10 months filming. He became part of the team who were putting in the central bit, the pixel detector. He fell so in love with CERN and the scientists fell so in love with him that basically he stayed with us for 10 months. And he comes back every single month, actually. <laughs> um, so I paired him with this scientist with the beard who um, is an engineer on the pixel detector. And the pixel detector is the very heart of that big machine which I just showed you, which actually takes the snapshots of the invisible particles. Because I couldn't think of anything more poetic than a filmmaker taking pictures, being apprenticed to the detector which takes pictures. It just seemed perfect to me. And then it gets a bit more perfect because um, 
Jan was very special because he loved going down to that giant camera and cr put it, confronting it with Super 8, really old film, 15 mil film, and even a camera obscura. He was down there with the camera obscura. So he confronted the latest in technology with the oldest technologies of recording. Um, we're very excited to see what happens with his documentary. And when I say documentary, it will be like no other documentary. He's an artist, so he would change everything. And he very much does time travel in his pieces. It would be a very personalized, almost Walter Mitty um, art piece. And I am, he's in the editing room now, and maybe it will come out next year. We shall see. Anyway, also what we do at CERN is we do naughty things with the artists, which is really great. We intervene in the spaces of CERN in the hallowed library. So this is a dancer just popping out of a shelf with a, a very appropriate book saying, don't make me think. And they did this intervention unannounced. One day we went into the CERN library. We didn't announce that there were three dancers. CERN library, very serious, very quiet. Dancers were absolutely intent on dancing and also being invisible when they danced. I did say, how can you do that? But um, they said, we will do it. Anyway, the extraordinary thing is, here they are dancing, and they were actually somersaulting in front of a physicist who was studying, who didn't notice. It was quite incredible. Um, it was absolutely mad. And this image, this photograph, went viral around the world. It was in the Huffington Post in The Guardian. And in fact, I think this is a meditation this piece, really, this photograph, shows you the sublime focus of a physicist and their passion, as well as... Thank you very much, Gustavo Schwartz and Donostio International Physics Center for inviting me to come here to San Sebastian. Uh, very excited to be in San Sebastian, which is an extraordinary place, and you have your own art science um, collisions happening at DIPC, thanks to Gustavo, who's making collisions between literature and science. Uh, but what I'm going to talk to you about is some collisions <laughs> which happen at CERN in Geneva um, and how they happen. I sometimes say, I kind of tease the Director General of CERN and I say to him, um, look, you know, we got this great experiment which is the Large Hadron Collider which has discovered the existence of the Higgs boson, a particle which gives matter mass, but actually we've got many, many theories about human imagination and creativity and ingenuity, but we've never discovered those, and those are the most elusive things of all. And what we're doing at CERN is making collisions between imaginations of the artists and science. So it's another great experiment, which I sometimes say to the Director General we're having. Um, and he laughs and says, yes. So CERN is an extraordinary place. And uh, one thing which has kind of come out of it, I'm going to start with this thing, is a choreography, which is now on a world international tour. It's covered 80,000 kilometers. Um, it opened in New York last week. Um, and it opens in Vancouver in two days. It's called Quantum and it was by our first artist in residence who came in 2012, Gilles Jobin. And I'm just going to play you a little clip so you get a kind of feel for this choreography, which came out of the ideas of science. It's not describing it or illustrating it. It's just a choreography which came out of it. So you'll have to forgive me. I'm really bad at... Um, PowerPoint. I'm really bad at this... Um, uh, computing with um, PC. I'm going to use a Mac.
has gone off as well. <laughs> yeah, technologically not very good, so you're going to have to bear with me during this whole exercise. Um, Quantum basically was a choreography which came out of Gilles Jobin's residency with us, which was for three months, and I will talk about that soon. But first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about CERN and what we do there. CERN is a fundamental research laboratory for science, but I've now also created it as a fundamental research laboratory for the arts and for artists of many different kinds, whether it's dancers, whether it's sculptors, whether it's data artists, hopefully soon writers, many different art forms, filmmakers, for example. And CERN is unusual in the science world because we don't create science which um, is applied knowledge, we just seek knowledge for its own sake. So exactly the same principles are given to the artists. They just seek creating things for its own sake and discovery there. So this is CERN. <laughs> this is a kind of representation. It's a 27 kilometer ring under the earth and it is the world's largest man-made machine which recreates the moment just after the universe was born. It's located across two frontiers, across the frontier of Switzerland and France. So it's very wonderful that it's also engaging with another frontier, which is the one between arts and science. So it's very appropriate in many ways that it does that. On the ring, the 27 kilometer ring, there are four giant detectors. If you imagine, that the ATLAS detector and the CMS detector, which are diagonally opposite each other, they're like giant cameras. And when we collide particles, which you and I are made up of, they're the fundamental thing which we're made up of, we collide them in the 27 kilometer machine. And these um, detectors take photographs of them in essence, it's a kind of way of describing what they do, take snapshots of the particles as they collide together and smash together and have spray coming off it. Um, they are quite extraordinary uh, things. And actually, if you look at them, oh, they're the only thing of their kind made in the universe. Each one is totally unique. Uh, it's a prototype which is actually working so it, in a way, it's an art form in its own right because there's no other thing like it. Each one is totally different. CERN came out of the Second World War uh, when after the devastation of the Second World War, um, scientists fled to the USA and Europe was very concerned about it and said, we need to bring them back. Um, and we need to show that science is for peace and for peaceful means. So CERN was created in 1954, 54, yeah, and it's our 60th anniversary this year. The mission of CERN is to push back the frontiers of knowledge, to understand that moment just after the universe was born, to develop new technologies for doing this, train scientists and engineers of tomorrow, and unite people from all over the world. So my argument always was, <gasps> you can't leave out arts from this because artists have a frontiers of knowledge. They engage with the senses, which is a form of knowledge, as well as intuition. Artists engage with a lot of the new technologies and they can also, they need training as well and they come from different countries as well. So there's a perfect match. That was one of my arguments <laughs> to the Director General of CERN. Uh, the other argument was to be a true cultural force in the 21st century, you can't just be uh, science and technology, you have to also engage with the arts. In that way, you really are engaging with everything in the world which makes us human. Because science, technology, and the arts are expressions of what it is to be human in the world and why and how we are in the world. They just do it in different ways and have different procedures. But they're both 
totally driven by discovery and wanting to go further and find out more. Probably heard of CERN because in uh, July the 4th, 2012, we discovered the so-called famous Higgs boson, which had been a theory postulated about 40 years before by three scientists, but in fact, um, there were three other scientists who had also been in, had thought of that theory as well. But it's always known as the Higgs, but actually it wasn't just one man, it was many other people contributed to that knowledge. As I said, CERN was founded in 54 by 12 European states, and today there are 21 European member states which fund it. Spain was actually one of the original funder, founders of CERN and has always been involved. Um, CERN itself employs only 2,000 people, but there are 11,000 people from around the world who are paid by their institutions who come to CERN. So they come from 100 countries around the world, um, actually. And so, for example, some bits of the machinery have been supplied by Japan, have been supplied by the USA in exchange for knowledge. So there's subsidization in that way as well as the member states paying for CERN. And that map just shows you where CERN exists. So anything which is white is where CERN doesn't exist. So it gives you an idea that there, there's representations all around the world. And um, yeah. So as I said, we push back the frontiers of knowledge. And the great thing about science is it doesn't give you the truth. In fact, we know so little. Uh, we only know about 5 6% of the universe, really, and we don't know about the other 95%. Um, so think about it. We don't know anything at all, really. And so it's great to try and find out more. And one of the things we're trying to find out at CERN is why this material world, which we exist in, actually came into being, how it came into being. How, did, how come you're sitting on a chair and it's solid? Because when the universe was born and matter and antimatter collided, luckily there was less antimatter. We should be in an antimaterial world, but instead we're in a material world in which we exist. So how did that happen and why? This just gives you an idea, really, of what we're doing. We go back in time. We sometimes say we're a super microscope because we go way back in time with our machine, which is the one you can see, that, um, that kind of pipe, that's the magnet through which um, the dipoles, through which the particles are accelerated. And we go below the atom, below the molecule, we go right below the nucleus, and we go down to the fundamental particles which make us up, and those are called quarks. So very quickly, some things have come out of the engagement with um, looking at the universe, and that's just accident, really. So PET scans, MRI scans, for example, have come out of uh, us investigating the universe, um, and imaging, medical imaging, but things like actually touch screens, mice and computers, they've all come out of CERN technology. The World Wide Web was born at CERN, that came out of it, and that's really revolutionized our life. But that, those all came out as a byproduct, not as the reason why CERN existed, which kind of shows the beauty of fundamental research, knowledge for its own sake. Um, uh, this is just a very quick thing. So we sometimes say we're the fastest racetrack on the planet because we accelerate our protons, these particles, just under the speed of light in opposite directions, and they collide um, 11,000 times a second. But they do that in big bunches. So actually, there are 100,000 collisions per second. It makes your head fall off. I always get really kind of when I think about that. Um, and out of that, we take all the data, but only of 100 collisions per second. We throw the rest away. It's a very empty place as well, because we create the vacuums inside the dipoles in order to allow the particles to go under the speed of light. And also, to keep it cool, we have a cryogenic system, 
where everything is minus 271 degrees Celsius. So the Large Hadron Collider, this 27-kilometer machine, is actually what even is one of the coldest places there is in the universe. I mean, it's even colder than outer space. But it's also the hottest place in the galaxy as well, where the protons collide, because they generate energy which is the equivalent of a thousand million times the, the thing of the sun, the warmth of the sun, but in a very tiny microscopic space. So if you think about it, the human ingenuity and engineering and science and technology which has created this is absolutely incredible. And as I said, they are, they've got these big detectors which are like giant cameras which record the collisions as they happen uh, in the big machine. And in order to crunch all the data, we have an extensive computer system. We have a distributive grid system where computers around the world are actually crunching the data as it happens. Um, this gives you an idea of the kind of running jobs in just 5.7 seconds, exactly what was happening at that, at that moment that's in Gibby bytes, which is kind of makes your head fall off if you knew how big that was. Uh, it's an extraordinary speed, and the crunching is happen happening almost in real time. So why, why on earth, when you've got this incredible machine, have we got the arts happening at CERN? What on earth is that doing there? Um, well, if you look at Picasso and the Cubist movement and the whole of the 20th century, has is visionary in many different ways. So that, in brief, is the Arts at CERN program. And um, I'm here, and you can ask me any, any questions at all about this program, which started in 2011, first artists came 2012, and we're now in 2014. Muchas gracias, eh, Arián, por, por tu charla y por incluir el comentario que habíamos comentado en la comida acerca de que eh, podían sacar el limpio a los científicos de esta interacción. Eh, bueno, tenemos un tiempo para preguntas y comentarios, así que si algún valiente se anima a comenzar. Sí, Arancha. Thank you. Maybe I will ask in English. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. It was really fantastic to hear you. I have two very practical questions. Mm. One is, how do you choose the scientist or how do you convince them to work with an artist in this matching you do? I mean, I'm talking about persons. Mm. And this is the first question. And the second one, very practical also, it's about money. Uh, mm. Do you... Do you <laughs> yes, money. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> do you pay the artist? How much do, mm. do they get paid? Do you also maybe pay the scientists as mm -hmm. they do in other programs? That would be the two questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so how do I choose the scientists? Well, I do an open call for scientists to take part in the program. Or I sometimes actually nab a scientist who I meet. So I met a scientist in a pantomime wielding a sword wearing tights. And he started talking to me. I thought, gosh, you're a really great communicator. You're really good. And he had this kind of incredible openness and curiosity. So I just grabbed him and I said, Tom, I really want you to be an inspiration partner. Will you want to be it? Um, and I actually matched him with Ryoji Akida. Um, the way I match is actually quite sophisticated because um, three months before the artist comes in residency, as I said, they come to us for four days and are introduced to different scientists. And um, afterwards, I talk to the scientists and say, what do you think about that artist? How would you like to work with them? Well, how would they take you further? And then I ask the same question to the artist about the scientist. And then I have my own thoughts because I'm a producer and I'm used to matching people who would take each other further. Now, some artists will say, oh, I really like that scientist. And the scientist will say, I really like that artist. I'm not going to name names, but there was one artist who chose somebody exactly like him. And I went, no, sorry. You're not going to be matched with that person. He said, can't I have two? 
so I have that one. I went, no, he's too like you. You need somebody who's going to really take you further. I'm sorry. So he was matched with this other art, uh, uh, scientist. I'm not going to give away who it is. And they have taken each other further. And it was totally perfect. So it's um, a marriage made in many different ways. Now, the money question. Okay, so I fundraise for the artists um, to come. The scientists don't get paid extra for participating. They just have to have the willingness to participate. They're funded by their home institutions to be at CERN. And they do it in their spare time. They do it as an extra, uh, in, in fact. Um, the artists get paid. They get a stipend or a prize money, which is 5,000 Swiss francs a month. Um, they also get their travel fees, subsistent costs. So I'm basically raising for each artist, um, because Switzerland is incredibly expensive. So this is going to sound like a lot of money, okay? Uh, but Switzerland is horrific in terms of expenses. I raise about... <laughs> I raise 60,000 Swiss, which is about 50,000 euros per artist. Um, and that's for the residency program and for the research program, I raise slightly less than that. But that's all externally fundraised for. Mm. You obviously work in the arts, otherwise you wouldn't be asking this question. Two very fundamental questions, matching and, um, uh, and funding. What do you do out of interest? <laughs> you've I run a program called uh, Improbable Connections that ah, connects artists right. and, and, okay, and organizations. I've heard, of, I've heard of Improbable Connections. Okay, congratulations on the program. Yeah. My question is about the explain extremely well how do you connect how do you connect artists and the funding and all that? The pardon, the scientists and the funding and all that. But how do you choose the artists? Oh. Uh, Oh, God, I sometimes think that's the easy bit. Um, we do an open call, and we select them. What I'm looking for from the artists is curiosity, almost humility. So, for example, Bill Fontana is a very well-known sound sculptor. And in his two-minute video, which his son said, that is rubbish, Dad, you're not submitting that. Because basically, it was just Bill standing in front of some Venetian blinds. It wasn't arty at all. <laughs> and this was his testimony as to why he wanted to come to CERN. He just said, oh, I feel like a kid. I feel as though I'm just beginning my career. I've got so much to explore. I want to go out of my depth. I know nothing about particle physics. Um, and I just want to see what I can find. I have no idea what I could find. Well, to have a world-class artist saying that and being so open to explore and discover... I thought, gosh, you know, that's wonderful. So we chose him because of that, for example. So I'm always looking for openness and curiosity and a willingness not to describe <laughs> the science or illustrate it, but somebody who really is conceptually driven and also will do new work, has that potential to do new work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I just want to make two small clarifications for the audience. Oh, no, it's me and my, uh, my um, uh, popularization of science. No. I can feel it. <laughs> More important than that. Mm. It's not true that Spain was one of the founding fathers of CERN. Oh, was it not? I thought it no. was. Okay. CERN, as you rightly say, mm. was created in 1954. Mm. Okay. And the convention was signed by 12 countries. Mm. That is precisely right. Mm. But Spain joined CERN in 1961. Oh, sorry. But stayed there only for a short period of time, mm. until 1968. Okay. And then joined back in 1983. Okay. So we had been only two-thirds of the time full members of CERN. Uh -huh. And the second clarification... Okay. Also, to avoid misunderstanding, is one of your beautiful slides. Uh -oh. <laughs> you mentioned that 50% of this installation came from the other side of the Atlantic. Mm. That is not right. The contribution mm. of the United States was extremely small for the construction of the machine, mm. less than 2 or 3%. Mm. 
the thing was essentially built by the European countries, by mm. the same member states. Mm -hmm. So this is just for the sake of clarification. Thank so you. Thank, thank you for the clarification. Very much indeed. I suppose because CERN, Spain is so present at CERN, it's kind of incredible that I assumed you were. So yeah, because thank you. Spain yeah. is a big country. Yeah. And in that sense, we are now the fifth contributors to the CERN budget, yeah. 8.5%. So we are now a big country. Mm. We mm. have built in the last 30 years mm. a very competitive uh, community, yeah. but uh, has been really difficult, you can imagine. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sí. Thank you. Más preguntas eh, aquí, Luisa. Sí, bueno, yo también en primer lugar eh, agradecerle su presentación que ha sido muy magnífica, inspiradora. Eh, mi pregunta no es tan concreta, es un poco más abstracta. Yo creo que hemos visto que efectivamente hay una gran eh, influencia del entorno científico para los artistas. Eh, a mí me interesa sobre todo la influencia de los artistas en los científicos o en la manera de, de ver ciencia. Y, y mi pregunta es, ¿cree usted que, que hay una, eh, alguna transformación, diríamos que, que podemos esperar una influencia en un sentido de, de introducir en la, en la ciencia eh, preocupaciones eh, más humanísticas o más eh, cercanas a, a la, la, la experiencia diaria de la gente por el hecho de juntar artistas con eh, científicos. ¿Puede cambiar realmente la manera de eh, hacer ciencia por estar cerca de los artistas? I know my experience with Julius has changed the way I look at my theory and will really change the way I do it, but I can't tell you how. Um, and other scientists have said, I now realize sometimes that the detours are very important when I'm creating an experiment, that actually a detour can give me more clues than me going in a straightforward way. But it's very difficult to prove. That's all I can say. And all I can say is that what the scientists say to me, that actually it makes them in touch with being human again um, and gives them a human context to their world. So it's all anecdotal. You can't actually prove it. It's not like you don't have a work of art which can prove it. All you can say is what, um, what the scientists say. And I was talking to Gustavo about that earlier and we were joking why don't we just wire them all up like lab rats and see the neurons firing in the brain and show that their neurons are firing in different ways when they engage with the arts. Well, I don't want to ch turn scientists into lab rats. Yeah. Eh, me voy a permitir agregar un comentario en relación con, con esta pregunta, porque, bueno, incluso es algo que hemos puesto en la obra de teatro que te había comentado antes en, en la entrevista, y lo que dice uno de los personajes... Mm. Dice, el método científico permite verificar hipótesis, pero no formular hipótesis. La que formula las hipótesis es la intuición. Entonces, yo creo que en ese sentido, la, la intuición se puede alimentar de diferentes fuentes. Y yo creo que no hay que eh, despreciar ninguna de las fuentes que puedan, de alguna manera, eh, provocar ese, ese, esa, esa, esa intuición, ¿no? Eh, luego, después, esas intuiciones habrá que verificarlas. Y allí es donde, donde entra el, el método científico. Mm. Eh, ¿Más preguntas? Sí, por favor. Hello. Thank you for your conference. Um, just one small question. You said uh, from reality, that's the, there is a part we know and the, a part we don't know, which is much, much bigger than the part we know, right? Uh, it is, uh, the, the part of reality we are still uh, investigating, that's what nine, theory 90, physicists do, right? Yeah, that's 94% exactly. we don't know. Exactly. 
and uh, from, six percent. from that part that we don't know, uh, there is a part of it which we cannot even imagine, I mean, in, in especially or in time, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so there comes art and artists uh, trying to help scientists uh, in new perspectives or twisted ideas or whatever, right? But you said uh, you didn't want your artists to uh, illustrate science. Mm -hmm. You didn't want it, the, the, the program, you didn't want the, this program to be an illustrative part of the, what the scientists did at CERN. But don't you think uh, you could uh, help with artist uh, representations to, to illustrate or to show or to bring closer to people with, as me uh, who cannot imagine uh, in how geometrically or in time the, the ideas that these uh, physicists uh, have? Uh, don't you think it could be illustrative? But you said you didn't want it to be illustrative, so... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there are different ways of approaching it. So CERN does have an outreach program where we work with um, photographers or we have comic book illustrators, for example, who illustrate and describe the science. So absolutely, artists play a very, very key role in communicating and illustrating science just this program is about not enslaving the arts to the science but showing a, a holistic vision of culture where they're both on the same platform but those two programs coexist happily together but yes yeah. good evening is this program of matching science and artists um, originally created by the CERN, or in that case, is that being copied by other laboratories in, around the world, or being uh, uh, in shown interest on it? Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, 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 hmm, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, other. I mean, if you look at the whole history of art science interactions in the USA, for example. Uh, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, there were very strong movements with artists and scientists working together. For example, the Bell Laboratory is a very famous experiment. So there's a whole history of this happening. Um, so I wouldn't say it has never happened before, absolutely not. This particular program is created specifically for CERN and was initiated by CERN. Um, and the mission of putting the artists and the scientists on the same level has inspired other activity. So for example, in South Korea, they now have a program which um, follows and matches that very, very exactly. Um, and there are many other labs who are copying it as well. Um, for example, in Chile, they're copying it as well, very directly, the same model and the same process. So, um, yeah. Más preguntas o algún comentario? Oops. Sí. Espera <laughs> el micrófono, por favor. Hi. Hello. Uh, thanks for the presentation first. Yeah, it shows you are really passionate about this, so uh, it's great. Um, my question is about my cousin. He's an artist also. Uh, he's becoming more abstract, you know, he paints white on white and stuff like that. And sometimes I don't really understand. So many times we end up talking about what, what is art. Uh, we never reach a clear conclusion. So here we are talking about uh, colliding worlds. So my question is, could you give us a scientific definition of what art is? <laughs> oh dear. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, so I can't, unfortunately. Gustavo, scientist, sitting next to me. How would you define it? Te voy a responder. Put this on, check what you're saying. Hay una, hay una frase de Julio Cortázar que, que a mí me gusta mucho y que la uso en estas situaciones, que es, él suele decir, la poesía es todo aquello que queda fuera de la definición de poesía. ¿No? 
es, es muy difícil definir las cosas cuando las cosas son complejas. En general podemos dar eh, definiciones precisas de cosas simples, pero definir cosas, incluso la ciencia, o sea, definir qué es ciencia no es sencillo. Se, se, se organizan congresos enteros con gente discutiendo durante años para ver qué es ciencia y no se llega a una, a una conclusión clara. ¿no? Hay cosas que sí son y hay cosas que no son, pero hay otras que están ahí que, que no se sabe. ¿no? Y yo creo que en el caso del arte es exactamente lo mismo. Y lo mismo pasa el otro día en una charla en Cucha también eh, con la definición de, de qué es vida, ¿no? de qué cosas son seres vivos. Y no hay una definición que encaje con todos los hechos observables. ¿no? Uno coge una definición y siempre hay algo que queda fuera de eso. Entonces yo creo que cuando las cosas son realmente complejas, eh, intentar una definición precisa eh, es casi una pérdida de tiempo, te diría. Sí, Luisa, por favor. Yo sí, eh, dado que nosotros hemos estado eh, trabajando juntos, una escritora y un científico, eh, a, la, a la pregunta que se hace, sí, sí me gustaría decir una cosa. Eh, quizá lo que ha caracterizado siempre las relaciones con la ciencia y con el arte es que eh, el arte ha querido muchas veces explicarse como ciencia, por ejemplo la literatura, ¿no? eh, es decir, eh, que, que no es una cuestión de pura inspiración, sino que tiene sus reglas, etc. O sea, ha habido desde, desde el comienzo, desde Aristóteles, ese deseo de, de alguna manera eh, crear una tierra firme también como ciencia, y lo mismo la ciencia ha buscado eh, casi formas de legitimidad también en el arte, utilizando un vocabulario eh, afín, hablando de belleza, eh, etc. ¿no? Yo creo que lo interesante es que siempre han buscado una tensión en el otro, y constantemente desde que, desde que esas disciplinas existen, esos, eh, esos puentes, y quizá este programa se llama Mestizaje, eh, por eso a mí me parece interesante no llegar nunca a la definición eh, quieta, sino a esa eh, búsqueda siempre de tener lo otro. Y a mí me parece que en esa definición eh, entran. ¿no? Vemos muchas veces, yo estaba mirando esas imágenes eh, de algo científico y estaba pensando en, en la belleza, estaba pensando en, en, en cosas como hubiera mirado un, un cuadro o el cielo, y lo mismo eh, en la literatura o en otras artes, se busca también eh, pensar que hay, que hay reglas, que hay normas, que hay constantes que se pueden, eh, que se pueden eh, repetir y reproducir. A mí me parece interesante esa tensión entre, entre ambas. ¿Alguna otra pregunta o comentario? Sí, sí por favor. Bueno, yo una muy simple porque no llego a más. Eh, si esta máquina, mmm, que es para una part, o sea, para un choque de partículas, este programa de mmm, artistas con científicos dentro de un sitio donde pienso que la ciencia tiene un nivel más o menos máximo, eh, esto es un proyecto, pero de ello se pueden sacar proyectos completamente diferentes. ¿Y a qué va? Va simplemente a la ciencia o la ciencia unida con el individuo, o sea, con el planeta, con los que vivimos, para ser más coherentes y, y, y ir a más en nuestra inteligencia o en nuestro ser. Es la máquina la que se ha puesto, pero ¿para qué se ha puesto solo? ¿Para la ciencia o la ciencia y el hombre? to answer that question and is extremely well qualified, is the best qualified person in the room. He's on his way. <laughs> no, yo creo que hay que intentar evitar confusiones. O sea, esta ciencia, esta máquina se ha hecho siguiendo la tradición de por qué se han hecho máquinas similares, más sencillas, desde hace cerca de 80 años. Porque yo creo que una de las cosas que distingue al ser humano de los dos seres vivos es la curiosidad, el deseo de aprender cosas no conocidas, explorar nuevos territorios. 
Y realmente esta máquina, que es, como se ha dicho, la más compleja y la más grande, pero no la más costosa, la más costosa de la Estación Espacial Internacional, que ha costado 30 veces más que el LHC, ¿eh? esta máquina lo que quiere es insistir, profundizar en el deseo que tiene el hombre civilizado de conocer nuevas cosas. Lo que ocurre es que la ciencia, cuando progresa, eh, produce resultados que desafían la intuición humana. Y como resultado de estas investigaciones se producen cosas, se producen descubrimientos que afectan otras ciencias, pero que afectan sobre todo la vida de los individuos. Y el ejemplo que ha citado Arián, uno de ellos es el World Wide Web, el WWW. Eso es una creación científica que es un producto colateral del deseo que tenemos en conocer realmente cómo se ha generado, cuáles son las leyes que gobiernan el universo, la naturaleza última de la materia, las fuerzas fundamentales, etcétera, etcétera. Hay otros muchos ejemplos, dos los cité yo ayer en la conferencia que di en Cucha, cuando a final de los años 20 Dirac propone la idea de la existencia de antipartículas, de antimateria, la gente pensaba que eso era un ejercicio de puro interés académico, intelectual. No es cierto. Los que hoy hemos tenido que utilizar por una razón, razón u otra la tomografía por emisión de positrones, nos damos cuenta que la antimateria juega hoy un papel esencial en los tratamientos médicos. Lo mismo ocurre con los aceleradores de partículas, de los cuales el LHC es su exponente más sofisticado. Son instrumentos que se crearon pues, hace 80 años, se inventaron hace 80 años, para escudriñar la naturaleza última de la materia. Hoy en el mundo hay del orden de 25.000 aceleradores de partículas. Solo unas decenas se utilizan para investigación fundamental. La mayoría tienen utilizaciones industriales y médicas. Por lo tanto, no nos confundamos. Se construyen estas máquinas por el deseo de saciar la curiosidad de los seres civilizados, pero los efectos colaterales tienen una importancia extraordinaria para la sociedad y para otras ciencias. Gracias. Gracias por, por esta explicación tan detallada. Eh, ¿Más preguntas? Bueno, si no hay más preguntas, agradecemos de nuevo a Arián. Eh, perdón, un, un último, un último.